there. Have you ever wondered just how long your color film processing chemistry will actually last? There's usually a data sheet with official recommendations on capacity and useful life, but those tend to be overly conservative. Way too often I find myself wanting to push these limits. While I enjoy the process and convenience of developing my own color film, I'm never able to shoot nearly enough to actually exhaust anything before it supposedly expires. This problem tends to be a lot worse with color because all the good chemicals come in larger volumes that can't be mixed on demand from a long-lived concentrate like many black and white developers. Since I didn't want to blindly follow those overly conservative manufacturer recommendations or trust general hearsay, I decided to take a somewhat empirical approach to this problem. As such, I'd like to share my results with the community. I'm going to start by reviewing my materials and equipment. Then I'm going to go over how my processing workflow has evolved over the course of the past year, alongside periodic testing. Finally, I'm going to review the data I've collected during all of this and come to some conclusions. If you'd like a quick summary up front, let me just say that my chemicals lasted a lot longer than what the manufacturer said they would. But without testing, I don't think I'd have been willing to even try pushing them that far. Now let's get into it. Last March, I ordered my first C41 color chemistry kit. I went for the Fuji Hunt Express C41 5 liter kit. As far as I know, it is the only kit available in the US that contains all the chemicals for the full C41 process. That means having separate bleach and fixer rather than Blix. A few months later, I finally opened the kit and mixed one liter of all the relevant chemicals to do my first processing run. A few days later, I read some forum posts talking about how developer part C doesn't keep once opened. So I then went ahead and mixed the remaining four liters of developer and stored it in a series of completely full one liter bottles. First, I kept those four bottles in the refrigerator, but later decided to just keep them at room temperature. This was because forum advice was quite unclear as to how to make them keep best. To monitor my chemistry and process, I've been using Fuji C41 process control strips. These are basically strips of undeveloped film which have been pre-exposed by a machine which you can then process yourself and compare to an included reference strip. To inspect these test strips, I've been using an X-Rite 810 densitometer. This is a machine that can look at processed film and give you actual numeric density measurements that you can then track and compare. Over the course of the past year, I processed and measured several test strips. I usually process a test strip when I'm unsure of the quality of my currently in use bottle of developer or when I open the next bottle of developer. During this time period, my workflow has changed dramatically. When I first mixed my chemistry, I was doing inversion processing by hand and using a Cinestill TCS-1000 to maintain temperature. I was also reusing a given liter of chemistry across multiple processing runs and multiple rolls of film. I later got myself a Jobo CPP3 rotary processor and switched over to it for all of my processing. Once using the Jobo, I stopped with chemistry reuse and switched to OneShot. This is a bit more practical with a rotary machine like the Jobo because you use less overall chemistry in a given processing run. In total, I've processed and measured six strips using developer from all five bottles that I mixed up from my kit. This took place in a somewhat ad hoc fashion, so I'd like to quickly review the conditions under which each strip was processed. The first strip was inversion processed in July of 2019 with reused developer from bottle number one. The developer looked murky at the time, so I was unsure as to whether or not it was still good. The strip seemed to come out all right, at least visually, 
but I didn't yet have a densitometer to inspect it properly. The second strip was also inversion processed in August of 2019 with fresh developer from the top of bottle number two. The third strip was processed on the Jobo in November of 2019 with fresh developer from the top of bottle three. The fourth strip was processed on the Jobo in January of 2020 with fresh developer from the top of bottle four. The fifth strip was processed on the Jobo in March of 2020 with developer also from bottle four. For this one, I had left the bottle partially full and topped off with Tetanol Protectan for about two months. The sixth and final strip was processed on the Jobo in June of 2020, approximately a year after first mixing up the chemistry, with fresh developer from the top of bottle five. After this one, I managed to finish the bottle and conclude the experiment. Here's where things finally get interesting, I hope. Now, I'm no expert at C41 process control, nor am I trying to do things to commercial standards, but I've tried my best, probably beyond what anyone would consider reasonable for a hobbyist. The most comprehensive reference I found on how to do all of this is Kodak Publication Z-131, specifically Chapter 5, Process Monitoring and Troubleshooting. I'll include a link to it in the description below. This Kodak document goes into excruciating detail on charting, aim values, action and control limits, and even provides detailed flow charts on how to, to troubleshoot your process. While you can certainly go to town on all these details, and to some extent I already have, here's what it really boils down to. You measure the reference strip, then measure your own strips, then crunch a bunch of numbers and draw a few graphs. You then use those graphs to determine how well your process is performing. That all being said, here's how I did it. I began by using my densitometer to measure all the color patches on the reference strip. I then took these values, along with the included list of correction factors, and started to build out a spreadsheet. Then I went ahead and measured each of my process test strips and added their values in as well. This gave me a big table of raw data from which to begin. I then added columns and formulas to the spreadsheet to calculate various derived values also described in Kodak Publication Z131. These values included the high-low density difference, the RGB spread of the high-low density difference, and the difference in the blue channel between the DMAX patch and the yellow patch. I then built a table that compared the reference strip values to my own test strip values to see how far off my processing actually was. Finally, I graphed all the columns for which Z131 actually gives aim values and control limits for to show how my numbers differed from the reference values. This includes the low density measurement, the D-min or minimum density measurement, the high low density difference, the difference in the blue channel between the D-max patch and the yellow patch, and the RGB spread of the high-low density difference. When you look at these graphs, a bunch of interesting observations immediately jump out. First and foremost, there's a huge difference in processing quality between inversion tanks and rotary processing on a Jobo. This difference is measurably larger than any other change in my results over the course of the entire past year. Second, that murky developer I used to process my first strip, yeah, it probably wasn't all that great. This is why it's better to actually make measurements rather than eyeballing it or attempting to fiddle a comparison without the proper tools. Third, the chemistry was probably good to professional standards for at least six months and clearly good enough for personal standards out to at least a year. Since the numbers really didn't change all that much during the latter half of the year, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if this stuff could last even longer. Of course, there are two more factors that are worth mentioning. First, while I do calibrate it properly, my densitometer does have limits to its accuracy and repeatability. While these potential errors are extremely small, 
they are still within the same order of magnitude as Kodak's process tolerances. As such, you have to assume some fudge factor when looking at the data. Second, Kodak does specify storage and handling guidelines for the control strips that are completely impractical for me to actually follow. If I did follow them to the letter, I'd probably end up wasting the majority of my stock of strips. As such, I use the best effort approach. I keep a box of strips in the freezer when not in use, but remove and defrost the whole box when I want to remove a strip for processing. This temperature cycling might have an effect, but hopefully not enough of one to matter for my purposes. So, what did I learn from all of this? If you mix your C41 developer and store the working solution in a series of completely full bottles, it can actually last you well over a year. This is extremely comforting especially if you prefer to use chemistry that is no longer sold in smaller quantities. Also, switching to a Jobo really does make a difference. I'm not sure if it's due to agitation or simply better temperature control of the entire processing cycle. I wouldn't be surprised if it's both. I'll include a link to a copy of my spreadsheet in the description below in case you'd like to check my data or even use it for your own process control. I'll also include a link to Kodak publication Z131 in case you want to dig deeper into the whole subject. I hope this was an interesting and educational adventure. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. Please like, share, subscribe, and have fun with analog photography.